So there's a few things I'd like to cover as we're here in Rajkia and tomorrow we're going to Nalanda. First thing I would like to talk about since we just did a lovely puja and had a lovely quiet meditation in the Velavana, the ancient site of the Velavana bamboo grove first monastery ever in this Buddha's dispensation, then remember it was also the place where the Awadapati Moka was taught. So that's actually not a very long text. And I thought since it's fresh in our minds and we just uh, went and paid respects there, should read through that and we can contemplate what it was that the Buddha actually taught. Often in Thailand people come together because they're very impressed by the miracle that 1,250 Arahants spontaneously gathered on the full moon in the month of Manka, but sometimes not actually so interested in what the Buddha taught them, which is more important than the fact of the miracle. So let's have a look at what he taught. Later the Padimokkha became the 227 monks' rules. In the beginning, this first utterance of the Padimokkha, it was laying down a framework of principles that uh, if the monks could live within those principles, basically most of the rules wouldn't have been needed to be made. But as the Sangha grew in numbers, then Perhaps the quality of the monks wasn't the same as the very first few thousand who were all extraordinary arahants. Uh, after that, when monks were in training and at different stages in their capacities and their development, certain things came up and more and more rules need to be laid down. Some of them also were cultural. It wasn't just the monks did something wrong. It was that culturally certain things were appropriate, inappropriate. So the Buddha made rules to help his sasana last a long time. There's always different translations, but the first line is, enduring patience is the highest austerity. It's also sometimes translated as patient endurance is foremost among austere practices because it burns up the kilesa of greed and hatred and delusion the supreme incinerator of defilements that is sometimes translated as. Nibbana is supreme, say the Buddhas. He is not a true monk who harms another, nor a true renunciate who oppresses others. This is uh, the Dhammapada verse, it's part of the Awadapati Moka that most Buddhists know. To avoid all evil, to cultivate good, and to cleanse one's mind. This is the teaching of Buddhas. Not despising, not harming, restraint according to the code of monastic discipline. Moderation in food, dwelling in solitude, devotion to meditation, this is the teaching of Buddhas. So some very central, important themes there. I think it is important for the Buddha to keep it really clear and simple so that in the future when he's not there to qualify things anymore people can refer to this this is one of the earliest teachings about what's appropriate in terms of restraint and composure and later generations because we're talking about how some people get enlightened it seems much more easily than others and we if we don't understand we're going to explore a bit later the causes for the apparent quick enlightenment that lay way in the past. But we can misunderstand, for example, Nang Wisaka, she became a Sotapanna at the age of seven, and she still went, went ahead and had many children and beautiful jewels and lovely dresses and etc. etc. But if you read the history of her vow, she had actually trained in taking care of many previous Buddhas and her development or her position as the foremost female supporter of the Sangha in that final life is a result of not exaggerating millions of lives. And when we look what the Buddha says, the teachings of Buddhas, patient endurance, you can see there's a lot of renunciation involved basically. What, what this is pointing to is when it comes to greed, we have to restrain it. 
And when we restrain it, we have to endure with the pain of desire. There's really no way around it. So it's a lot of people get a bit deluded about this idea. If you're just generous, if you're generous enough, you don't have to restrain your desire and eventually you'll be enlightened like Visakha. It's not true. And this is why Buddha makes it really clear. What he's saying in terms of a spiritual practitioner, moderation in food, devotion to meditation, delighting in solitude, this is the teaching of Buddhas. So there's a lot of sense restraint, there's a lot of renunciation. This is inevitable, this is the real practice of Dhamma. So that's restraining the energies of greed, which regards restraining the energies of anger. It's just very clear, not despising, not harming. He's not a true monk who harms another, and not a true renunciate who oppresses others. It's very clear, isn't it? If you harm, if you oppress, you're not a spiritual practitioner. Simple. No, absolutely no room for negotiation there. If you harm, if you oppress, this is for the monks. You are not a true monk. You are not a summoner. But it extends to any sincere spiritual practitioner, doesn't it? So, as we get further away from the Buddha's dispensation and there's more pressure on people in some respect to be flexible with their level of sila and uh, traditions of making merit, people can get into this I'll make a certain amount of bad karma and I'll make up for it by making good karma but basically if your livelihood is involved with harming beings you can't consider yourself a genuine spiritual practitioner so basically we have to purify our livelihood for monks that means, as the Buddha said devotion to meditation and restraint within the monastic discipline that's the right livelihood of monks and how we should behave so also, coming back now to Venerable Sariputta, remember it was at Velavana that Sariputta walked in and Mahamogalana walked in and the Buddha, the Buddha was teaching a group of monks and he said, here are my two chief disciples. It's a very special place. At the end of that teaching, the Buddha was teaching the monks present who were not yet Arahants, became Arahants. Sariputta and Mahamogalana did not. They went into retreat and Mahamogalana became an Arahant after a week. Sariputta became an Arahant after two weeks. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the original vow that made it possible for this right-hand man of the Buddha to become enlightened after listening to one four-line stanza, to become a Sotapanna, and then to become the Arahant with the wisdom equal to the Buddha after two more weeks of practice. And we can see that uh, the origin of that was a long time ago. So I should say that this is not a direct Sutta reference. This is coming from the ancient commentary. It does make sense though. And it's uh, held to be true by most people. I'm talking about the time where Sariputta made his vow, what the occasion was. At that time, the being who was to become the Venerable Sariputta was born into a rich Brahmin family and was given the name Sarada. At the same time, the future Moggallana was born into a wealthy householder family and was named Siriwadana. The two families were acquainted and the boys became playmates and close friends. On the death of his father, Sarada inherited the vast family fortune. But before long, reflecting in solitude on his own inevitable mortality, he decided to abandon all his property and go forth seeking a path to deliverance. Sarada approached his friend Siriwadana and invited him to join him on his quest. But Siriwadana, still too strongly attached to the world, refused. Sarada, however, was firm in his decision. He gave away all his wealth, left the household and took up the life of a matted hair ascetic. Quickly and without difficulty, he mastered the mundane meditative attainments and supernormal powers and attracted to himself a band of disciples. Thus his hermitage gradually became home to a large community of ascetics. At this time, the Buddha Anamodasi, the 18th Buddha, counting back from the present Buddha Gautama, had arisen in the world. One day on emerging from meditative, meditative absorption, 
The Buddha Anamodasi cast his net of knowledge out upon the world and beheld the ascetic Sarada and his retinue. Realizing that a visit to this community would bring great benefits to many beings, he left behind his monks and journeyed to their hermitage alone. Sarada noticed the marks of physical excellence on the body of his visitor and at once understood that his guest was a fully enlightened one. He humbly offered him a seat of honor and provided him with a meal from the food gathered by his disciples. Meanwhile, the Buddha's monks had come to join him at the hermitage. 100,000 arahants, free from all defilements, led by the two chief disciples, Nisaba and Anuma. To honor the Buddha, the ascetic Sarada took a large canopy of flowers and, standing behind the Blessed One, held it over his head. The master entered the attainment of cessation, Niroda Samapati, the meditative state wherein perception, feeling and other mental processes utterly cease. He remained absorbed in, the, in this state for a full week, while throughout that entire week, Sarada stood behind him, holding aloft the canopy of flowers. I'll just say something to you about this. That attainment is like the highest, purest meditative state. So when the Buddha did that, it looks to me like he's giving him this very special opportunity to make the most merit possible with his gesture. So in staying in that highest, possible meditative absorb absorption state and he's holding this canopy of flowers above him with great devotion for a week. At the end of the week the Buddha emerged from the attainment of cessation and requested his two chief disciples to give talks to the community of ascetics. When they had finished speaking he himself spoke and at the end of this discourse all the ascetic pupils of Sarada attained arahantship and asked to be admitted to the Buddhist order of monks. Sarada, however, did not attain arahantship nor any other stage of sanctity, for as he listened to the discourse of the chief disciple, Nisaba, and observed his pleasing deportment, the aspiration arose in his mind to become the first chief disciple of a Buddha in the future. Thus, when the proceedings were finished, he approached the Buddha Anamodasi, prostrated himself at his feet, and declared, Lord, as the fruit of the act of homage I perform toward you by holding the canopy of flowers over you for a week, I do not aspire for rulership over the gods, nor for the status of Mahabrahma, nor for any other fruit but this, that in the future I might become the chief disciple of a fully enlightened one. The master thought, will his aspiration succeed? And sending out his knowledge into the future, he saw that it would. Then he spoke to Sarada thus, this aspiration of yours will not be barren. In the future, after an incalculable age and 100,000 eons, a Buddha by the name of Gautama will arise in the world, and you will be his first chief disciple, the marshal of the Dhamma named Sariputta. After the Buddha left, Sarada went to his friend Siriwadana and urged him to make an aspiration to become the second chief disciple of Buddha Gautama. Siriwadana had a lavish arms hall built and after all the preparations were complete, invited the master and his monks to come for an alms meal. For a full week, Siriwadana provided the Buddha and the monks with their daily meal. At the end of the festivities, having offered costly robes to all the monks, he approached the Buddha and announced, By the power of this merit, may I become the second chief disciple of the same Buddha, under whom my friend Sarada will become the first chief disciple. The master looked into the future and seeing that the aspiration would be fulfilled, he gave Siriwadana the prediction. He would become the second chief disciple of the Buddha Gautama, a monk of great power and might, known by the name Moggallana. So you can see that the being that became Sariputta was already extraordinary. He attained, he gave up great wealth, he attained jhanas and psychic powers, he had a following, he had enough merit that the Buddha would personally come to teach him. It's pretty amazing. And then, after that, he's got 100,000 eons to go. So you, you can imagine that before that, there's been a great deal of preparation already. And I would assume that this Buddha, Anamodasi, was able to see this is chief disciple material. And he's doing his... The Buddha's like a CEO of his dispensation, but he's all, he also has an eye on the future Buddhas and a vast view and samsara and the intention to help as many beings as possible. And I would assume that he saw this one is, has potential for managing director of the future Buddha. 
And so we were talking overnight about why this is necessary. The Buddha, as a sage who ends up having kings as patrons, you can imagine he has to receive guests. There's a certain, there's a certain role that he has to play where he has to be available for royal people, military people, wealthy people. And you can see that the monk, the second-hand man, the right-hand man, who knows the teachings as well as the Buddha, has the same level of wisdom. You can see how important he is because he's less busy, but you can see how important he is in actually ratifying, getting the work done, establishing those beings in, in liberation. So it's why Buddhas need foremost disciples. But one thing I wanted to talk about as well as this, because we're going to the village where Sariputta was born and also where he passed away tomorrow, uh, last pilgrimage we didn't spend as long in Rajkia, so we've got a bit more time to explore some of these other wonderful characters around the Buddha. You can see the results of all of the investment of building beautiful qualities. Sariputta is known for his wisdom, equal to the Buddha in wisdom. But what is less known about him is how kind he was, and how humble, and how modest. And when you read about these qualities, it's very, very moving. And so I'll share a little bit with you about how, because unlike uh, many managing directors, there's a couple of nice managing directors in this room, so these comments aren't about you. But unlike, unlike uh, some managing directors, people can become arrogant, people can become cruel, people can become proud. They're number two, and they give, give the orders, and check the results, and fire people, all of that stuff. That's part of the job. But you'll see Sariputta was number two, and incredibly humble. It's very inspiring, actually. So he's a, he's a beautiful model to hold up of someone who is, and in Thai we would say, both very geng and very narak. So you have uh, someone who's extremely talented, extremely skilled, and extremely lovely. So that's why I'm a big fan of Sariputta. Among the bhikkhus, Sariputta was outstanding as one who helped others. In the Devadaha Sutta, the Buddha himself said of his great disciple, Sariputta bhikkhus is wise and a helper of his fellow monks. The commentary in explanation of these words refers to a traditional distinction among the ways of helping others. Sariputta was a helper in two ways, by giving material help and by giving the help of the Dhamma. Elaborating on the way he provided material help, the commentary says that the elder did not go on arms round in the early morning, as the other bhikkhus did. Instead, when they had all gone, he walked around the entire monastery grounds, and wherever he saw an unswept place, he swept it. Wherever refuse had not been re removed, he threw it away. Where furniture such as beds and chairs or earthenware had not been properly arranged, he put them in order. He did this so that the non-Buddhist ascetics who might visit the monastery would not see any disorderliness and speak in contempt of the bhikkhus. And then he used to go to the hall for the sick, and having spoken consoling words to the patients, he would ask them about their needs. To procure their requirements, he took with him young novices and went in search of medicine either by way of the customary arms round or to some appropriate place. When the medicine was obtained, he would give it to the novices, saying, Caring for the sick has been praised by the master. Go now, good people, and be heedful. After sending them back to the monastery, sick room, he would go on the arms round or take his meal at a supporter's house. The above was his routine when staying for some time at a monastery. But when going on a journey on foot with the Blessed One, he did not walk at the head of the procession, shod with sandals and umbrella in hand as one who thinks, I am the chief disciple. Rather, he would let the young novices take his bowl and robes and go on ahead with the others, while he himself would first attend to those who were old, very young or unwell, making them apply oil to any sores they might have on their bodies. Then either later on the same day or on the next day, he would leave together with them. Because of his solicitude for others, on one occasion Sariputta arrived particularly late at a place where the others were resting. For this reason he did not get proper quarters and had to pass the night seated under a tent made from robes. Having seen this, the next day the master caused the monks to assemble and told them, 
the story of the elephant, the monkey and the partridge who, after deciding which was the eldest of them, lived together showing respect for the most senior. He then laid down the rule, the lodging should be allocated according to seniority. So that's very beautiful, isn't it? You imagine the monk foremost in wisdom establishing, I would imagine, many thousands, possibly tens of thousands, of beings in uh, states of liberation and having the status of being the right-hand man, the most important after the Buddha, and he's uh, checking to see if leaves are swept, the rubbish is thrown out, and uh, checking in on the sick people. So you can see the beautiful roundness of character that, that comes, obviously, from hard work over a long time. Because, you know, most, nobody's perfect except for the Buddha. And then Sariputta comes close as number two. But you can see, it's very beautiful to see what is the result of that path of building Barami so that you can be more helpful to more people. So Sariputta is a, a beautiful example of that. And uh, another thing I want to read is about his passing away. It's uh, actually quite a fun story. His mum was a Brahmin, and even though her son was the chief disciple of the Buddha, and by the end of his life had developed you know, a great deal of fame and respect and honor, and the mother still didn't have faith in him. It's very interesting, isn't it? We see the, the degree to which uh, Hindus, Brahmins, can be attached to their faith in their gods. And also, many other realized masters have said that it's difficult for children to teach their parents in general. The parents will tend to see their kids as their kids, no matter, <laughs> no matter what happens. But, so I'll, I'll read a little bit about that story. This occurred in Nalanda, so it's a, a nice thing to read about Nalanda. Before I talk about his death, I'd like to talk about his meditation skills. So he was not just a wonderful teacher and a great guy. He was an arahant, and he did have profound, liberated, purified mind and incredible meditation skills. And another reason I want to mention it now is because our Chinese Malaysian pilgrims chanted the Heart Sutra on Vulture's Peak this morning nine times. Those who can't speak Chinese, we were listening, meditating. The Heart Sutra talks about the ultimate empty nature of phenomena. And sometimes it's criticized because it has these phrases, there's no path, no fruit, no eyes, no ears, no, no nose, no tongue, no body. And it's basically like a negation, and it says there isn't anything. And people don't quite get that. But I'm going to read this explanation or description of Sariputta's meditation, and then I will consider that. On one occasion, Sariputta described to Ananda how he could enter a unique state of concentration in which he would not be cognizant of any familiar object of cognition. In regard to the earth element, he was without perception of earth. And so also in regard to the other three elements, the four immaterial objects and everything else pertaining to this world or even to the world beyond. And yet he said he was not entirely without perception. His only perception was Nibbana is the cessation of becoming. So, he's not aware of the earth, water, fire or air. He's not aware of this world or the other world. He's not aware of immaterial objects. Is there an eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, path or fruit in that experience? There isn't, is there? From the perspective of the enlightened mind delighting in its liberation, there isn't anything. I just thought I'd make that point. Ajahn Chah once a Western disciple in America read to him the Heart Sutra and Ajahn Chah said, it is a description of the highest wisdom. In that short version that they read to him, he, he said, it's a shame it doesn't describe more in more detail the way to realize that. Ajahn Anand has also said that contemplation of emptiness is the contemplation of the goal of liberation. 
So when you're liberated, you will understand emptiness and you will understand what is the experience of emptiness. But it's not nihilism. Something experiences the emptiness. The writer of this uh, piece comments, This inscrutable attainment seems to be identical with the meditative abiding in voidness, sunyata vihara, or abiding in emptiness, that the Venerable Sariputta regularly cultivated. We read in the Pindabhata Parisutta Sutta that the Buddha once noticed that Sariputta's features were serene and radiant and asked him how he had acquired such radiance. Sariputta replied that he frequently practiced the abiding in voidness. Thereupon, the Buddha explained that this was the abode of great men and proceeded to describe it in detail. The commentary identifies this abiding in voidness with the fruition attainment of arahantship, sunyata. Vihara can also be described as abiding in emptiness. When Sariputta became absorbed in this meditative state, even the gods from the highest heavens descended to venerate him, as the Venerable Mahakasava testifies in the following verses. These many devas, powerful and glorious, ten thousand devas from Brahma's company, stand with joined hands worshipping him, Sariputta, wise marshal of the Dhamma, the great meditator in concentration, Homage to you, O thoroughbred man. Homage to you, O supreme man. We do not know what it is in dependence on which you meditate. So that's very interesting. You understand the Brahma Devas are the most adept at concentration and coming from the highest heavens. They can see an incredible radiance. They come down and venerate it. And they can't see where he is. That's the... But the Buddha's teachings lead to heaven and beyond. So this is the beyond. It's sometimes called Nibbana Dhatu, the Nibbana element, the liberated state, something that only people who have experienced it experience. But it's all of our potential. So as I read now about Sariputta's passing into final Nibbana, then you'll see some of these devas who had great respect for him come and pay their respects to him. We now come to the year of the Master's Parinibbana, his complete passing away. The Blessed One had spent the rainy season at Belugvagama, a village near Vaisali. And when the retreat was over, he left that place and returned by stages to Savati, arriving back at the Jetavana Monastery. There the elder Sariputta, the Marshal of the Dhamma, paid homage to the Blessed One and went to his day quarters. When his own disciples had saluted him and left, he swept the place and spread his leather mat. Then having rinsed his feet, he sat down cross-legged and entered into the fruition attainment of arahantship. At the time predetermined by him, he arose from the meditation and this thought occurred to him. Do the enlightened ones pass away into final nibbana first, or do the chief disciples do so? And he saw that it is the chief disciples who pass away first. Thereupon he considered his own life force and saw that its residue would sustain him for only one more week. Then he considered, where shall I attain final Nibbana? And he thought, Rahula attained final Nibbana among the deities of the 33. The elder Anyakondanya at the Chadanta Lake in the Himalayas. Where then shall I pass away? While thinking this over repeatedly, he remembered his mother and the thought came to him. Although she is the mother of seven arahants, she has no faith in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. Has she the supportive conditions in her to acquire that faith, or has she not? Investigating the matter, he discerned that she had the supportive conditions for the path of stream entry. And then he asked himself, through whose instruction can she win to the penetration of truth? He saw that it could not come about through anyone else's instruction in the Dhamma but his own. This is a... Uh, I want to make a comment here. Sariputta is sometimes misunderstood to not have psychic powers, and that is, a, that is a misunderstanding. Because there was one occasion where he was meditating and a yaka, a demonic entity, came and whacked him on the back of the head and he didn't notice and he didn't feel anything. The reason he didn't notice or feel anything is because he was in a jhana. So when the mind turns inward into a jhanic state, and it's also the reason his head didn't explode, if you, if you are in a meditative jhanic state, as I have heard, the physical organism can't be hurt. 
but also the mind has turned away from outward sensory if it's a higher jhanic state, it's turned away from the sense objects so it's not aware of sights or sounds or feelings it's absorbed inwardly so he came out of that and uh, Mahamogalana said, how are you feeling, Sariputta? And he says, well, I feel okay, got a bit of a headache. And he said, yeah, this yaka just came and whacked you on the back of the head and anyone else's head would have exploded. And he said, he said, it's wonderful, it's marvelous. I didn't see so much as a mud sprite, but Mahamogalana saw that. But the reason he didn't see the mud sprite is he was in his absorption. So here you have him contemplating himself, where should I die? And it's obviously through his own abilities that he, he becomes aware the chief disciples become, should pass away before the Buddha. And then he considers, where should I die? And then he remembers his mum's. And then he considers, does she have the capacity? And then she, he sees that she has the capacity to be a stream enterer. So that's him using his psychic powers. And this is the way these great arahants use their psychic powers. They can see the level of barami that beings have. That's why Lord Buddha can scan the world after his morning meditation and see who is ripe, go and teach them, and they become enlightened. So it's using the divine eye, and it can see that in us, the level of our accumulated virtue, how much kilesa is in there, how much mindfulness, how much concentration, how much wisdom, how much merit has been produced purifying the mind, how ripe is the mind, and then they know the ones that they can teach and the ones they can't teach. Another analogy is like when the Buddha was considering not teaching and Brahma Sahampati said to him, there are beings who will understand. And then he surveyed the world and he saw that beings are like lotuses. Some of them are in the mud, most of them are in the mud. Some of them are in murky water. Some are up close to the light beginning to open and some are above the water ready to open. And he saw, yes, there are beings who have spiritual faculties which are ripe enough to blossom if the Buddha teaches him. So here Sariputta is investigating his mother's mind with his own mind and he's able to see, oh she is ripe and the only one that can teach her is me so he's going to pay his last debt of gratitude to his dear old mum he saw that it could not come about through anyone else's instruction in the Dhamma but his own and following upon that there came the thought if I now remain indifferent people will say Sariputta has been a helper to so many others on the day, for instance, when he preached the discourse to the deities of tranquil mind, a large number of devas attained arahantship, and still more of them penetrated to the first three paths. And on other occasions, there were many who attained to stream entry, and there were thousands of families who were reborn in heavenly worlds after the elder had inspired them with joyous confidence in the triple gem. Yet despite this, he cannot remove the wrong views of his own mother. Thus people may speak of me. Therefore, I shall free my mother from her wrong views and shall attain final Nibbana in the very chamber where I was born. Having made that decision, he thought, This very day I shall ask the Master's permission and then leave for Nalaka. And calling the elder Chunda, who was his attendant, he said, Friend Chunda, please ask our group of 500 bhikkhus to take their bowls and robes, for I wish to go to Nalaka. And the elder Chunda did as he was bidden. The bhikkhus put their lodgings in order, took their bowls and robes, and presented themselves before the elder Sariputta. He, for his own part, had tidied up his living quarters and swept the place where he used to spend the day. Standing at the gate, he looked back at the place, thinking, This is my last sight of it. There will be no more coming back. Then, together with the 500 bhikkhus, he went to the Blessed One. This is in Savati, probably Jetavana, which we will go to in a few days. Then together with the 500 bhikkhus, he went to the Blessed One, saluted him and spoke, O Lord, may the Blessed One permit, may the Exalted One consent. The time has come for me to attain final Nibbana. I have relinquished the life force. Lord of the world, O greatest sage, I soon shall be released from life. Going and coming shall be no more. This is the last time I worship you. Short is the life that now remains to me, but seven days from now, and I shall lay this body down, throwing the burden off. Grant it, O Master, give permission, Lord. At last the time has come for my final Nibbana. Now I have relinquished the will to live. Now, says the text, if the enlightened one were to have replied, you may attain final Nibbana, hostile sectarians would say that he was speaking in praise of death, and if he had replied, do not attain final Nibbana, they would say that he extolled the continuation of the round of existence. Therefore, the Blessed One did not speak in either way, but asked, Where will you attain final Nibbana? 
Sariputta replied, in the Magadha country, in a village called Nalaka, in the chamber where I was born. Then the Blessed One said, do Sariputta what you think timely, but now your elder and younger brethren in the Sangha will no longer have the chance to see a bhikkhu like you. Give them one last discourse on the Dhamma. The great elder then gave a discourse in which he displayed all his wondrous powers, rising to the loftiest heights of truth, descending to mundane truths, rising again and again, descending, he expounded the Dhamma directly and with similes, and when he had ended his discourse, he paid homage at the feet of the Master. Embracing his legs, he said, so that I might worship these feet, I have fulfilled the ten perfections throughout an incalculable period and a hundred thousand eons. My heart's wish has found fulfillment. From now on there will be no more contact or meeting. That intimate connection is now severed. I shall soon enter the city of Nibbana, the unaging, undying, peaceful, blissful, heart-assaging and secure, which has been entered by many hundreds of thousands of Buddhas. If any deed or word of mine did not please you, O Lord, may the Blessed One forgive me. It is now time for me to go. Now once before, the Buddha had answered this when he said, There is nothing, be it in deeds or words, for which I should have to reproach you, Sariputta. For you are learned, Sariputta, of great wisdom, of broad and bright wisdom, of quick, keen and penetrative wisdom. So now he answered in the same way. I forgive you, Sariputta, he said but there was not a single word or deed of yours that was displeasing to me. Do now, Sariputta, what you think timely. From this we see that on those few occasions when the Master seemed to reproach his disciple, it was not that he was displeased with him in any way, but rather that he was pointing out another approach to a situation, another way of viewing a problem. Immediately after the Master had given his permission and Sariputta had risen from paying homage at his feet, the great earth cried out and with a single huge tremor shook to its watery boundaries. It was as though the great earth wished to say, though I bear these girdling mountain ranges with Mount Meru, the encircling mountain walls in the Himalayas, I cannot sustain on this day so vast an accumulation of virtue. And mighty thunder split the heavens, a vast cloud appeared and heavy rain poured down. Then the Blessed One thought, I shall now permit the Marshal of the Dhamma to depart, and he rose from the seat of the Dhamma, went to, to his fragrant cell, and there stood on the jewel slab. Three times Sariputta circumambulated the cell, keeping it to his right, and paid reverence at the four places, and this thought was in his mind. It was an incalculable period and a hundred thousand eons ago that I prostrated at the feet of Buddha Anamodasi and made the aspiration to see you. This aspiration has been realized, and I have seen you. At the first meeting, it was my first sight of you. Now it is my last, and there will be none in the future. And with raised hands, joined in salutation, he departed, going backwards until the Blessed One was out of sight. And yet again, the great earth, unable to bear it, trembled to its watery boundaries. The Blessed One then addressed the bhikkhus who surrounded him. Go, bhikkhus, he said, accompany your elder brother. At these words, all the four assemblies of devotees at once went out of Jetavana, leaving the Blessed One there alone. The citizens of Savati, also having heard the news, went out of the city in an unending stream, carrying incense and flowers in their hands and with their, wet, their hair wet, the sign of the morning. They followed the elder lamenting and weeping. Sariputta then admonished the crowd, saying, This is a road that none can avoid, and asked them to return. And to the monks who had accompanied him, he said, You may go back now. Do not neglect the master. Thus he made them go back, and with only his own group of disciples he continued on his way. Yet still some of the people followed him, lamenting, Formerly our noble monk went on journeys and returned, but this is a journey without return. To them the elder said, Be heedful friends, of such nature indeed are all things that are formed and conditioned, and he made them turn back. During his journey, Sariputta spent one night wherever he stopped, and thus for one week he favored many people with a last sight of him. Reaching Nalika village in the evening, he stopped near a banyan tree at the village gate. It happened at that time a nephew of the elder Uparavata by name had gone outside the village and there saw Sariputta. He approached the elder, saluted him and remained standing. The elder asked him, is your grand aunt at home? Yes, venerable sir, he replied. Then go and announce our coming, said the elder. And if she asks why I have come, tell her that I shall stay in the village for one day. 
and ask her to prepare my birth chamber and provide lodgings for 500 bhikkhus. Aparawata went to his grandaunt and said, Grandaunt, my uncle has come. Where is he now, she asked, at the village gate. Is he alone or has he someone else come with him? He has come with 500 bhikkhus. And when she asked him why has he come, he gave her the message the elder had entrusted to him. Then she thought, why does he ask me to provide lodgings for so many? After becoming a monk in his youth, does he want to be a layman again in his old age? But she arranged the birth chamber for the elder and lodgings for the bhikkhus and torches lit and then sent for the elder. Sariputta, accompanied by the bhikkhus, then went up to the terrace of the house and entered his birth chamber. After sitting down, he asked the bhikkhus to go to their quarters. They had hardly left when a grave illness, dysentery, fell upon the elder and he felt severe pains. When one pail was brought in, another was carried out. The Brahmin woman thought, the news of my son is not good, and she stood leaning by the door of her own room. And then it happened, the text tells us, that the four great divine kings asked themselves, where may he now be dwelling, the marshal of the Dhamma? And they perceived, they perceived that he was at Nalika in his birth chamber, lying on the bed of his final passing away. Let us go for a last sight of him, they said. That's the four divine kings of the Chatu Maharaja. We were chanting the Dhammachaka Sutu. Today, the devas of the four kings, the lowest heaven realm. When they reached the birth chamber, they saluted the elder and remained standing. Who are you? asked the elder. We are the great divine kings, venerable sir. Why have you come? We want to attend on you during your illness. Let it be, said Sariputta. There is an attendant here. You may go. When they had left, they came in the same manner, Saka, or Indra, the king of the Devas, and after him, Mahabrahma. And all of them, the elder dismissed in the same way. The Brahman woman, seeing the coming and going of these deities, asked herself, who could they have been who paid homage to my son and then left? And she went to the door of the elder's room and asked the venerable Chunda for news about the elder's condition. Chunda conveyed the inquiry to the elder, telling him, the great Upasika, lay devotee, has come. Sariputta asked her, Why have you come at this unusual hour? To see you, dear, she replied. Tell me, who were those who came first? The four great divine kings, Upasika. Are you then greater than they? she asked. They are like temple attendants, said the elder. Ever since our master took rebirth, they have stood guard over him with swords in hand. After they had left, who was it that came then, dear? It was Saka, king of the Devas. Are you then greater than the king of the Devas, dear? He is like a novice who carries a bhikkhu's belongings, answered Sariputta. When our master returned from the heaven of the thirty-three, Saka took his bowl and robe and descended to earth together with him. And when Saka had gone, who was it that came after him, filling the room with his radiance? Upasika, that was your own lord and master, Mahabrahma. Then are you greater, my son, even than my lord, Mahabrahma? Yes, Upasika. On the day when our master was born, it is said that four Mahabrahmas received the great being in a golden net. Upon hearing this, the Brahman woman thought, If my son's power is such as this, what must be the majestic power of my son's master and lord? And while she was thinking this, suddenly rapture and joy arose in her, suffusing her entire body. The elder thought, rapture and joy have arisen in my mother. Now is the time to preach the Dhamma to her. And he said, what was it you were thinking about, Upasika? I was thinking, she replied, if my son has such virtue, what must be the virtue of his master? Sariputta answered, at the moment of my master's birth, at his great renunciation of worldly life, on his attaining enlightenment, and at his first turning of the Dhamma wheel, on all these occasions the ten thousandfold world system quaked and shook. None is there who equals him in virtue, in concentration, in wisdom, in deliverance, and in the knowledge and vision of deliverance. And then he explained to her in detail the words of homage. Such indeed is that blessed one, Itibiso Bhagawa. And thus he gave her an exposition of the Dhamma, basing it on the virtues of the Buddha. When the Dharma talk given by her beloved son had come to an end, the Brahman woman was firmly established in the freed of stream entry and she said, O oh my dear Upatissa, why did you act like that? 
Why during all these years did you not bestow on me this ambrosial knowledge of the deathless? The elder thought, now I have given my mother the Brahman woman, Rupasari, the nursing fee for bringing me up. This should suffice. And he dismissed her with the words, you may go now, Upasika. When she was gone, he said, what is the time now, Chunda? Venerable sir, it is early dawn. And the elder said, let the community of bhikkhus assemble. When the bhikkhus had assembled, he said to Chunda, lift me up to a sitting position, Chunda. And Chunda did so. Then the elder spoke to the bhikkhu, saying, For forty-four years I have lived and travelled with you, my brethren. If any deed or word of mine was unpleasant to you, forgive me, brethren. And they replied, Venerable Sir, you have never given us the least displeasure, although we have followed you inseparably like your shadow. But may you, Venerable Sir, grant forgiveness to us. After the elder gathered his large robe around him, covering his face, and lay down on his right side, then, just as the master was to do at his own parinibbana, he entered into the nine successive attainments of meditation in forward and reverse order, and beginning again with the first absorption, he led his meditation up to the fourth absorption, and at the moment after he entered it, just at the crest of the rising sun appeared over the horizon, he utterly passed away into the nibbana element without residue. And it was the full moon day of the month Katika, which by the solar calendar corresponds to October and November. So, that's how Sariputta passed away. Very beautiful. Him leaving Savati and the entire monastic order following him and the entire village following him with wet hair and flowers and weeping. And He was such an impeccable example of wisdom and virtue and kindness the Buddha said there is not a single word that you said. Can you imagine serving somebody for 44 years and you didn't put a word out of place? Pretty amazing. But it came from a great deal of preparation and practice. So such extraordinary beings are dependent on conditions. There was among the nuns, foremost in wisdom, and among the bhikkhunis, there was foremost in psychic powers. I might just read a few of the in Thailand, they talk about the Buddha Borisat, the Buddhist company, and then Buddha Sasanikachon, the members of the, uh, of the company. And it, it's a bit like that, except that it, it doesn't exist for commerce or for making profits. It exists for helping people to grow spiritually. It's an altruistic corporation, but it does require the cooperation of a large team of uh, people with many skills of which the Buddha is obviously the head. Sariputta was his number two, Mahamogalana number three. But after that, you have uh, a great number of, of other wonderful monks. There was one, he's talking about interesting enlightenments. There was one woman by the name of Kema who was a consort, one of the king's uh, retinue, not his wife, and she was listening to, an, I, I can't remember who was relaying the teaching or giving the teaching in the palace, but she became an arahant. There she was dressed in her beautiful palace gear and listening to the sermon, she became an arahant in that one teaching. It's quite extraordinary. But one of the reasons I wanted to begin this talk with the Awada Padimoka is because you can be sure that in previous life she practiced sense restraint, she practiced moderation in food, she practiced living in seclusion, she practiced not harming. And that in that final life, it was very easy. So as we know, Sariputta was foremost in great wisdom, Mahamogalana, foremost in psychic potency, Foremost in ascetic practices, Mahakasapa. So you can see different monks and nuns need to be examples of different things. So on one level the Buddha is saying you should practice sense restraint and renunciation, be content with little, eat little, delight in the solitude. But then there are the monk and the nun who represent that perfectly. So that they don't just have the teaching, then they have the, the living flesh and blood role model. I won't go through them all, but I'll just mention a few. It'll be interesting. Lay people as well forest dwellers, so there were certain monks that wouldn't stay in kutis, would only sleep under trees, but the Buddha required that everybody sleep in a kuti in the wet season. But uh, outside of that, Ravata, sleeping under trees his whole life. 
Sivali, Thai people like Sivali because he was the arahant that got the most good stuff, foremost in offerings. <laughs> the one most pleasing and agreeable to devas, Palindavacha. Foremost to those who attain the analytical knowledges, Mahakotika. Foremost of the bhikkhus, who is most learned, that was Venerable Ananda, who had required that the Buddha tell him everything he taught everyone on every occasion and remembered it. Isn't that amazing? So that's a great discipleship. He put a lot of preparation into that. Ananda has several, he actually has, I think it's here, I can see five, he won five categories. Among those with a good memory, Ananda. Among those who with a quick grasp, getting the meaning quickly, Ananda. Foremost among those who are resolute, Ananda. Foremost among personal attendants, Ananda. And the monastery that I founded in Thailand, Anandagiri. <laughs> because we hope that the monks train themselves like Ananda. <coughs> the abbot also. So bhikkhunis, we have some very gifted bhikkhunis. The foremost in seniority of the bhikkhunis was Mahapajapati, the woman who had been the wet nurse to the Buddha after his mother passed away, his auntie. Among those with great wisdom is Kema, among those with psychic potency, Upalawana. So you can see you have the foremost in wisdom and the foremost in psychic power, and they will be performing a function very similar to Sariputta and Moggallana with the bhikkhunis, training them, ripening them through different stages of insight to complete liberation. Those who uphold the discipline, most foremost bhikkhuni was Patachara. Foremost among the meditators was Nanda. And the list goes on. So, foremost in recollecting past lives was Bada Kapilani. And then amongst the lay people, you have the foremost in donor, male one, is Sudatta Anattapindika, who offered the Jetavana. The foremost female lay donor, of course, is Visakha. And the list goes on. But you can see that by the time Lord Buddha attained his Buddhahood, he had the whole team there ready. And all these people had witnessed other great disciples or great attendants, male and female lay devotees, under previous Buddhas and become particularly inspired. They aspire for their own enlightenment, but they see... They find it very beautiful to aspire to helping a lot of other people as well. We need these great beings, uh, extra compassionate, highly inspired types to put in the, all of the extra work so that you have a beautifully well-oiled machine that is extremely effective and lasts a long time. You think about Buddhist monasticism in terms of cultural entities. 2,500 years is a long time. You think of how many countries have risen and fallen, risen and fallen, and how many wars, and how completely places change. And the uh, monastic discipline is basically the monastic discipline, the rules are the rules, the robes look pretty similar. And it's, it's amazing, actually, how clear and well-formulated and effective it is. And, uh, and also how many people have been involved in that and can wear seeing Lumpo Man and Ajahn Chah as coming from that lineage of Mahakasapa, really, the forest Dutanga tradition, keeping strictly the rules in letter and in meaning. So you need the example of the monks like Mahakasapa, and then you need those people who have the uh, integrity to practice like those people and keep holding down because they had the example. There were the monks that, that said, because not long after the Buddha passed away, there was one older monk that said, Oh, thank God he's dead. We don't have to keep those minor rules anymore. They're so annoying. So he'd only been, he'd only passed away not very long. And of course, one of the elders heard that in Mahakasapa, I believe, and said, we'll be keeping all the rules. And so he became, he became the one that represented the, those monks who were determined to keep the rules. And uh, yeah, the Theravada, the uh, forest, the strict vineyard practitioners in the Theravada, so anyway, we've covered quite a bit of ground. I thought it was good while we're in Rajgir to mention some of the things Lord Buddha taught at Velavana and also of his meeting of Sariputra and Moggallana as we're going to Nalanda tomorrow to bring to mind 
how uh, gracious and beautiful it was of Sariputta to walk in his final days as an old man to go and teach his dear old mum and uh, to see that the great arahants really are teachers of gods and humans. It's amazing, isn't it, that uh, Indra, the four great kings, Brahma, coming paying respects to the arahant. His, uh, I'm not sure if his mum saw a radiance or she actually saw the beings, but uh, she obviously had, was it six arahant children? Interesting, isn't it? Seven arahant children, okay, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> so, obviously you have to have a lot of, can you imagine how much merit you have that the beings coming into your womb have this incredible virtue, but there's a little bit of stubbornness, you know, which only a chief disciple could remove. I hope something I shared was useful.